Hello everyone, welcome back from the cookie break. I understand if people are hesitant to come back from that. Um, but we have a great talk lined up, if I say so myself. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how some primarily mobile brands use technology, use data, and create creative and original user experiences. So it looks like I'm on the manifesto deck, which is great. It's a good, it's a good slide deck. I'll switch so. you over real quick. So maybe while that's happening, I'll quickly introduce myself and what Branch Metrics is. My name is Will Lindemann. Um, I'm director of growth at Branch Metrics, and Branch, or Branch, if I put on my American voice, is a deep linking technology company that provides deep linking and features to help apps, we have over 9,000 apps, including some leading apps, build delightful and impactful user experiences. Who here has heard of Tinder? Okay, who here has heard of Branch Metrics? That is much closer than I expected. So, fantastic, I don't have to tell you too much. If you're confused about what deep linking is, deep linking is the ability to link someone to content in the app, either directly if they already have the app, or immediately after download if they have to go to the app store first. You'll see in this presentation a couple of examples of deep linking used in creative ways, which I hope will make it clearer. When we come to a talk like Manifesto, we're looking to learn a little, we're looking to be inspired a little, and we're also looking for something to take home. And that's what I hope you can take away from this presentation today, um, a couple of ideas that will inspire you in how you can build user experiences that really create an impact. So it's the afternoon, I want you to relax, take a deep breath, look at this serene, unrealistic picture of an empty phone. It's very calming. Um, if you work in mobile app, product management, development, marketing, then this would be your dream. Just a bunch of users with phones waiting to download your app. Unfortunately, it's not the reality. Most of us have something a little bit more like this. Some of us more organized than others. Some people can't stand that little two notification I have on the Espresso app over there. Um, not that this is my phone, but if it were my phone, then I would probably have some enemies in the audience. So given that the state of the ecosystem is more like this, it's very, very challenging to get a spot on somebody's homepage, with the challenges being other apps, being storage. And then even if you get it, how do you become the app that people want to click on? I have a special folder called iJunk, no offense, no offense to anyone at Apple, but this is all this, the bloatware that they kind of put on the phone that you don't want, that you have to put in a special folder because they don't let you delete it. Thank you, thank you fans in the audience. Um, so I have a special folder just for that stuff. So you're competing against this ecosystem. So it's more important than ever that you can kind of come up with a creative way to engage your users. And the structure of this talk is pretty simple. I mean, we're gonna talk about user acquisition, we're going to talk about activating users. And by activating, I mean kind of anything you want them to do within the first couple of days of using your app. So it might be literally just use my app day one, day two, day three. It may also be that I want you to actually sign up. It might be that I want you to make a purchase. It's that kind of first interaction that we've heard mentioned. Then we have user retention, which if you're listening to some of the first talks this morning, user retention is really where growth is now. Um, as director of growth, I'm allowed to say that that position means nothing if you're not actually keeping the users that you already have. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And what I want you to do as I speak is think about how this applies to you. These are all huge goals, so big that some of the earlier speakers today talked about having totally different teams just to do it. So don't be intimidated by the scope of this. Think critically about your app and your company and which of these make the most sense for you. The first thing I want you to think about is actually whether you're a mobile also or a mobile only company. We've just been talking about mobile apps today, like as if all mobile apps are the same. But a mobile also company is a company that primarily has their user base, either at the moment or traditionally, primarily has their user base somewhere other than in the mobile app. So that could be on web, that's the most obvious one, right? Amazon was founded on the web and most of its users are probably using the web. Now they're transitioning into the app, as Imager explained today, that a lot of their users are actually now primarily on the app. But they're still a mobile also company because they had a relationship with the brand. And you can also think of mobile also as being a company like Macy's where they have foot traffic probably more than anything else in their website. So if you're a mobile also company, you're going to treat 
your users and your product strategy a little different than if you're a mobile-only company. And mobile-only companies generally tend to be newer. They have the, pri the majority of their user base is on mobile. And sometimes it's because they're small apps, new apps. Sometimes it can be massive apps like Zynga. But the difference here is that they don't have somewhere else that they're trying to attract users. There's this return arrow here, which signifies that the users that they've retained are supposed to be driving more users to the app, hopefully. There are ads, but ads are a very challenging ecosystem in mobile, and something that there are whole conferences about ads. If you want to go hear about ads, there are many other conferences. Since this is manifesto, I'm avoiding ads. Hope that's OK with everyone. So first takeaway, nice and quick. Mobile also versus mobile only. Think about which one of these you are and have that inform your product strategy. And with each of these takeaways, I'm going to have a little data point that I want you to be thinking about either measuring point in time right now or measuring later on as you develop products. Here, a breakdown of web and app traffic. Very simple to measure, but very important. This is the analytics talk after all, so I have to talk about data knowing where your users are and where you want them to be. If you're trying to convert users, then think about how they're moving from one place, here I say web, to another, to the app. So let's talk about user acquisition a little bit. And there are many, many ways to acquire users. The one I want to focus on, because I think it's the most creative and original at the moment, is actually using mobile web specifically as your app's homepage. Using mobile web as a way to bond with the user before you have them download your app. This makes the most sense for a company like Jet. Who here has heard of Jet? Yeah, good, good amount of people in the audience. So Jet is a shopping uh, company that's taking on Amazon. There's been a lot of press about that kind of battle. Um, Jet has a huge mobile web user base. And they use a smart banner. It's kind of at the bottom down here. It says, get the jet.com app. And this smart banner is a little different to a regular smart banner, like the Apple default one that you may have seen. You can customize the text. But a smart banner is a really nice way of engaging users and getting them to get familiar with the app. So you're using the web to draw them into the content, a nice mobile web experience. But in this case, in Jet's case, they've actually put a little 15% off your first order uh, message to encourage people to download the app. So they have crazy good conversions from web to the app because of that little message that they put in there to encourage people to do it. So they build a relationship on web, and then they move them to the app. The other thing that's really important about how Jet does it is they link in the app to the content that was viewed on web. So you're looking at this Dawn Ultra Dishwashing Liquid Scent, Liquid Original Scent Detergent. That doesn't make you want to download the app. I don't know what will. So you're looking at this detergent online. And then you click the small banner to download the app. And you immediately have a discount, and you immediately have the thing you were looking at on web. So you've used web to drive the app download there. And that continual experience goes even beyond user acquisition. It goes into some of the onboarding flows and some of the activation steps we've talked about. So this is a really nice way to engage a user beyond. And if you were a little fuzzy on what deep linking is, this is a perfect example of what you can do with deep linking. You can have someone download the app and then continue their experience uh, in the app that they were having on web. This actually led to a 3x increase in daily downloads versus a vanilla smart banner. They were able to roll it out on Android and iOS. Um, so these experiences are not only novel, but they're also very, very impactful. But what if you're a mobile-only company, you don't have a website? We have a very cool technology called deep views. And what deep views are, are auto-generated web previews of app content. I'll repeat that, because it's not a very intuitive sentence auto-generated web previews of app content. So you have some data associated with this link about where it's going to link to. And you use that data on mobile web to generate a web page first. So the link knows where it's going to go. And the website can actually pull that data out of the link and generate a web page. I'm not going to spend too much time on how it works. But what this does is this allows a mobile-only company that has no website to, within seconds, give the user the experience of the content that they're then going to receive in the app. And so you're building this relationship with the customer that instead of taking them straight to the app store, so instead of clicking that link going straight to the app store, please download my app, you're able to show them this content. And then this uh, call to action down here, which you can't see very well, says get app for free. And they're six times more likely to download the app 
if they're seeing that content before. And this is kind of counterintuitive if you're a product manager and you hate adding steps to things, if you hate adding friction. This is good friction. This is friction where you're getting to show a piece of content and engage your user. So this actually has fantastic results. So second takeaway after mobile only mobile also is mobile web is your app's homepage. Feel free to get to know your users on mobile web, even if you're a mobile app, because you can use that before the download, and you can build that connection. The data here is to understand web to app user journeys. This is kind of difficult, um, and I'm happy to talk to people after about how it works. But understand how users flow from web to the app. It's a metric that not a lot of people are measuring, and it's incredibly important, um, whether you're a, primarily if you're a mo mobile also company, but also if you're a mobile only company. All right, let's talk about user activation. So you've got this user. You've acquired them somehow. How do you get them to really engage with your app straight away? What's the tactic you want to use to get them familiar with your app so that they can have a good experience? Postmates is a delivery app that does local delivery of almost anything you can imagine in your area. And they do a personalized welcome screen for every user. And again, I think Imager was talking a little bit that they want to customize the welcome. So with these deep links, you can send data through to the app. This is kind of the same data that you are using to create the web page in the deep view example. And here, Austin is receiving a text from his friend. And then when he gets into the Postmates app, he's seeing this light box specifically targeted to him. Now, there are a couple of interesting things about this light box. First, it has the name of the person who referred him. It says, Evan sent you $10 in delivery credit to try Postmates. So that's already some social proof. That's a little bit of more of a reason for me to go try the Postmates app and to engage with it in the first couple of minutes. Secondly, he's given me $10 in delivery credit. Fantastic. Who doesn't like free stuff? But seriously, think about how PayPal um, acquired its first user base. They literally were just giving out money. And they said, you know, we're just going to give you $10 in your PayPal account please try PayPal, because that was the only way to get a user to engage with the product. Postmates is, is a paid service, so you need money to be able to try it out. So they're overcoming that barrier. And something you might not have thought of as well, the third thing that's interesting about this is that it doesn't say, here's a promo code, please paste this into a screen. It says, we've already done the credit for you. Welcome to our app. Your friend referred you. You have $10 to try it out. And we've already applied the credit. So you've taken away two explicit points of friction, and then one sort of implicit one, which is that your friend is referring you. It's maybe not a point of friction you're overcoming, but it's a reason to continue. So your friend referred you. Here's $10 to try the app, which you don't have to worry about pasting in a promo code. And here's $10 to try the app so that you, well, actually can try the app. Um, so this is incredibly rewarding for the user. Personalized welcomes in general, this isn't specific to Postmates, but they can double install to sign up. We've seen even higher than this. So this is 80%, which is nearly double. But you can actually re receive even better metrics, uh, better results with this kind of welcome, because you're telling the user, welcoming them into the app. So you're also giving the user something before you're asking for it. You're saying, here's, here's a, welcome to my app. Here's a credit to try out. Now try out the app. This one is a little bit more out there, but I love it. And any kind of UX designers in the house are going to love this one, too. So this is an independent game developer called Ryan McLeod. And he has an amazing app called Black Box. And how Black Box works is it's a game that doesn't use the touch screen. So you download the game. It's entirely based around sensors. For example, you can complete a challenge by inverting the phone or shouting into the speaker or covering up the light sensor, or any number of these kind of interactive elements. And my mic's falling off. There we go. So it's really counterintuitive to how people are used to using a phone. But their onboarding, but his onboarding is fantastic. And he has this very short introduction where he tells you not a lot. It's a complex system, which is mysterious, and it's going to be frustrating. How many people are like, welcome to my game. It's going to be frustrating. Um, he actually makes that kind of part of his marketing spiel. But this second screen is what's really interesting. It says down here, I don't know if you can read it, a light represents a challenge. Then there's a light in the middle. So you're like, OK, that represents a challenge. Makes sense. And he's not saying swipe through and say, oh, a light represents a challenge, and you're going to have to use sensors, and this is how the game is going to work, and I really hope you enjoy my game. 
He's just put some inverted text at the top of the screen. So what do you do with inverted text? Well, you're going to turn your phone around. And when you turn the phone around, the challenge completes. So you've been given this experience. You're not being given explicitly money. You're not being given credit. But you are being given an experience that's engaging rather than the kind of three slide swipe. Um, so think about ways that you can kind of make your users interact with your app in a way that's complementary to the app. So overall, give before you take. When somebody comes to your app, try and give them something. Try and engage them so that they want to come back to your app the first couple of times. Um, you can do UX testing or A-B testing, depending on whether you're more of like a qualitative or a quantitative person. Um, and you can do some user studies and see which of those onboarding flows really resonates with people and which keep people coming back, while also achieving you know, the business goal that you have at hand. Retention. The funnest of the three challenges. Lots and lots of things out there for the first two. Well, definitely for user acquisition. Some things out there for user activation. But retention is a really sticky one. It's really you alone. So I thought it would be helpful to look at this very technical retention diagram that I have. Um, <laughs> this, I, I don't know why you're laughing. It's a very technical retention diagram. Uh, this is Tahoe. He is a puppy. Um, and that is a triangle on his head. Thank you. So why is a puppy up there? Well, I'll get to the puppy in a second. But first, let's talk about defining retention, because the only way I could get you to listen to a talk about defining retention is to show you a picture of a puppy and promise I'm about to explain why he's there. So when you're thinking about defining retention, there are a couple of terms that it's helpful to know. Rolling retention is a fairly common measure of retention. It's used by Flurry, if any of you use mobile analytics. And the idea of rolling retention seven-day rolling retention specifically, is if a user comes on day one to my app and then returns on day seven, eight, nine, ten, whenever, after day seven, we're going to count them as retained. We're going to say for seven-day retention, they were retained. They appeared after the day that I chose. Okay? So the nice thing about that is you don't have to worry about which day they came back after seven. You just know they came back. The bad thing about it is it doesn't really tell you anything about frequency. You don't know how kind of frequently they came back which is where classic retention comes in. Classic retention, seven-day classic retention, says if a user was in my app on day one, were they also in my app on day seven? Okay. Not day six, not day eight, were they there on day seven? And the disadvantage of classic retention is that if they didn't happen to come back on day seven, you're going to say they weren't seven-day retained. Even if they came back on days two, three, four, five, six, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, et cetera, you're going to say they're not retained. So when you're looking at rolling retention, you're generally looking at churn. You're looking at long-term retention. It's a way of measuring churn. And when you're looking at classic retention, you're going to look at all the days alongside each other, and you're going to see frequency. So classic retention is going to tell you how often are my users coming back to my app. So think about, for you, what is your goal? Is your main goal churn, or is it addictive behavior? Obviously, these things are complementary, which is why they're both retention, but they are different. Why do I have a puppy up there? That's what you want to know. The puppy is your user. The puppy is your user is naive. Your puppy, your user, doesn't know why it should like your app. Your user is easily distracted by all the other apps and exciting things in the world. Your user gets bored quickly by all, and is more interested in other apps and exciting things in the world and will tire of your app. And your puppy user also requires constant attention to gain its love. So what can we do with this knowledge? Well, dogs love treats, so do users. Literally reward the user for coming back to your app. There is nothing complicated about this concept. This is uh, an app by uh, Spryfox, which is a in small independent game developers. By the way, just in general, indie game developers have some amazing UX tips. You should definitely check them out. And Spryfox will credit you for coming back into their app. If you come back every 24 hours, they'll pay you in some in-game currency. Now, kind of like the Postmates example, they're giving you in-game currency, which is going to make you further engage with the game. So think about whenever you're rewarding users that you want to give them something that is going to enhance their experience, isn't just like you know, a token, but actually gives them something that they can use to further interact with the game. Be second nature. Use every opportunity you can to drive an app session. It's amazing how often when you have an app, 
you are directed to mobile web. It happens constantly. Pinterest, who I don't think I need to introduce, has done a really cool thing with Brunch where every link you click on mobile will take you to the Pinterest app. So they're not missing any chance to send you back into their app. They're retaining you just by merit of you clicking the same links you would always click and not going to mobile web. So if your app isn't doing that, think about how you can make it do that. You're just missing chances to kind of sell that user and get them in the app. Finally, appear when needed. When a puppy is hungry, provide them food. Users are similar. The context of where your user is when you want them to use your app is incredibly important and something we don't think about. And Joe mentioned this earlier. We don't think about it. We're like, when do we want our user to use the app? No, when does your user going to use your app? In this example, Yumly, which is a recipe app, partnered with Instacart, which is a grocery app. I think you can probably see where I'm going with this, right? So you're in the Yumly app, you're looking at a recipe, and there's a button down there that says shop for ingredients, and when you click it, you are deep linked into the Instacart app with your cart full of the ingredients you're going to need to cook that recipe. It makes perfect sense that these two things are together, and Yumly increased retention by 30% using this, because it made perfect sense that when I'm in a recipe app, I want to then go to a grocery app, right? So combining these two things together makes your user appreciate you being there when they need you. So just generically think about the context of, which, of when you're going to appeal to your user. So the final takeaway here is be present, be there when your user needs you, and be relevant. Be relevant to the context in which your user is looking to use your app. The piece of data that you can look at here, retention by engagement channel. I mentioned classic and rolling retention, decide which one of those you want, and then look at different engagement channels and see how those impact your uh, user retention. Where are you using push at the right time? Um, if somebody turns off push, you're kind of hosed. So some of these are nice examples of how you can kind of get around push if somebody decides to turn you off. But look at the data that's telling you where a user is coming from and when they're going to be best retained. So just to summarize, are you a mobile also or a mobile-only mobile company? Uh, do you have your user base split? Look at the breakdown of web and app traffic over time. Mobile web is your app's homepage. Mobile web is an incredibly powerful tool to drive app downloads. Don't dismiss it. Give before you take. Entice your user to use your app. Tell them why it's going to be valuable to them and welcome them into the app before you expect them to spend time in it. And finally, be present, be relevant, be always there to increase retention. Thank you very much.